Oh. My name is Ian. I work here at Cinema 21. And it is my incredible honor and privilege to welcome a, a survivor. <laughs> a true survivor of one of the greatest fiascos in cinema history, uh, Joe Gillis, who lost the battle but won the war. Here he is tonight, Greg Sestero. Yeah! Yeah! Um, 
And then he proceeded to have his best argument with the teacher, where he said, may I correct you? <laughs> you don't understand Stanley, I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> and um, the teacher just blew up. Basically, she like, was just about ready to kick him out of the class. I, of course, after that performance, I went up to him outside, and I was like, hey, I was wondering if you'd like to do a scene together. Um, and he was really shocked because I think he even thought that's a little crazy after the performance I just pulled. <laughs> Why would you be drawn to me? Um, so he was a little off putting. He's like, Yeah, I guess, you know. <laughs> well, maybe tomorrow, you know, you meet me at bank, uh, 3.30 p.m., I'll be late. <laughs> so I was like, 3.30 p.m. at the bank. It's a little off. <laughs> <laughs> but I figured, <laughs> That's the beauty of being uh, 19 years old, is you just go with the flow. So, I showed up at Bank of America on the NS. I had my football. Um, I didn't think, honestly, I didn't think he was going to show up. I figured I'd go play football at Golden Gate Park by myself. Um, but he did show up 30 minutes late, and I kind of wondered what would he drive? What kind of car would this guy drive? Like a key commission ice cream truck? <laughs> So he shows up at a brand new white Mercedes Benz. He leaves in my breath away. I was like, what? And he's like, this like cut off song. He's like, oh, get in. So I get in. And I'm like, hey, nice car. Don't talk about it. In class, please don't want to talk about it. I'm like, okay. And look, I need to go eat because I get cranky because I'm not able. So we ended up going to this little restaurant called Pasta Pomodoro on 24th Avenue. And we were sitting there, and he was kind of like looking, eating his soup, looking up at me, and he's like, So why do you ask me to do singing? I don't know, maybe I thought, uh, I thought we'd make a good team. Well, okay, let's see how good you are. And he hands me the play, and he just wants to start rehearsing right there in the class. Or right there at the restaurant, I'm like, uh, Okay, I start reading kind of low. He's like, Look, your voice has to go up, okay? You still want it? I thought to myself in that moment, why did I think this was a good idea? <laughs> I was really, really embarrassed. Um, and after we got out of that class, I was kind of ready to go back home. Uh, and he's like, I see you have your ball. Why don't we go, uh, why don't we go play Bobby Park? Why not? I was like, you're kind of dressed odd for it, but right, let's do it. And so we went to the park, and he's like, you know, I give you a little secret. Park is, this park is a good place for vampire. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so again, I was kind of trying to figure this out. We got down, we started playing catch, and that's when I started to see a different side of Tommy when he started asking me questions. You know, like, what did I want to do? What did I want to be? And so I just told him, you know, I told him that I almost got this part and I didn't get it, and I was ready to give up, and he's like, no, no, no. You don't why you give up, you can't be a big actor. You know? All these guys waiting for the big shot. And I was like, Yeah, you know, you maybe just you know, you gotta try your best. He's like, No, let me stop you, young man. <laughs> you have to be the best. Okay? So what do you want to do after class? He's like, I don't know, I want to go to LA. I'm in Los Angeles. Why? I want to be star. <laughs> let me tell you, I can help you maybe a little bit. <laughs> I have an apartment in Los Angeles. I charge you $200 a month. What? $200 a month for an apartment in LA. I was like, okay, well, what's it doing? Well, I have it down there. Nobody lives there now. But uh, maybe, you know, I have to go next week. Maybe you can come with me and check out. I've been trying for like a year and a half, working these odd jobs to save money just in the hope to get an apartment for like a couple months. And this was like, not getting the, the role in that movie basically springboarded me to be Tommy, and it was almost like it was like meant to be in a twisted way. Um, <laughs> I found out recently, Tommy did an interview, and he said that when we first met, um, I seemed like a lonely person. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, dude, you're one to talk. <laughs> so, so the biggest hurdle I knew that I was going to have was my overprotective mom who didn't want me to go to L.A. in the first place, and then now I was going to possibly go to L.A. with this guy, who I didn't know, and listen to him. 
apartment. <laughs> so when I told her the story, she thought I was throwing my life away. I was completely insane. And she wanted to meet Tommy before any of this happened. So I'm going to read you uh, how that exactly went down. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> my mother didn't bother introducing herself. Are you going to L.A., Tommy? Yes, I am. We are. We are going. <laughs> he was uncompromisingly stuttering from sheer nervousness. My mother nodded. Perhaps you could wait to go until next week so I can join you. No, I'm sorry. I have to go now. I have a meeting there. People waiting for me. She didn't even bother pretending to believe him. <laughs> Tommy, I'm a little bit concerned because uh, I'm looking at your eyes and they're completely red. It's obvious you haven't slept. Oh, by the way, side note. It looked like he had been doing math for like 60 hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a little concerned because I'm looking at your eyes and they're completely red. It's obvious you haven't slept. Well, I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> you're you're going to drive like this? I'm okay. <laughs> his arms up, smiling. My mother stared at him. Tommy, how old are you? I'm Greg's age. <laughs> oh, really? You're 19? I just turned 14. Happy birthday. <laughs> well, actually, I'm 28. She didn't believe this either. No one on planet Earth would have believed this. <laughs> Is that so, Tommy? Maybe then you could tell why you want to help my son. I think he's a cool guy. <laughs> well, that's very interesting because I'm very concerned, Tommy. Where are you going to stay in L.A.? Well, I have my place. He's fine. We go for one day. Is it safe, Tommy? I just don't feel good about this. Mom, I said, Mom, come on. My mother looked at me. She breathed very deeply as though letting go of something, which was, I guess, me. <laughs> then she looked back at Tommy. Be careful, Tommy, please. I will. <laughs> Tommy, don't hurt my son. I put my hand over my eyes. The worst thing Tommy could do in response to this request, I thought, would be to chuckle creepily. <laughs> <laughs> I would not. Tommy's head chuckling creepily. <laughs> And one more thing, Tommy. One more thing. No sex. <laughs> Tommy, are we clear? Well, we all do. <laughs> My mother looked at him coldly for a moment, and then she took a step toward him. What was that, Tommy? Tommy shrugged, beginning to panic. You know, we all do. I'm afraid I don't know what this means, but I think you understand me now. Translation, if you touch my son, I will kill you. <laughs> she walked away without saying goodbye. It took me a long, painful moment to accept that my mother had just asked another man not to have sex. <laughs> <laughs> I got into Tommy's car, emotionally concussed. <laughs> Once my mother was gone, he whirled on me. What the heck was that? <laughs> She's crazy. Your mother is off the wall. <laughs> crazy, my God. No sex. <laughs> what a story. <laughs> my mother was right about one thing. Tommy really hadn't slept all night. He started nodding off at the wheel as he drove away, so he pulled over and we switched seats. Tommy put a white t-shirt over his head and neck, tilted the seat back as far as it could go, and was bombed out and snoring by the time we hit the highway. It was August 31st, 1998. I had known Tommy was ill less than a month. <laughs> yeah. What a story, Mark. So we ended up making it to LA on that hot summer night, late afternoon. Um, we decided to go to a restaurant in which James Dean ate at that I'd read in this book, and apparently the waiter who knew James Dean owned that restaurant. So we were totally insane anyway. We, wanted to, we were like trying to track down James Dean. Um, so we went to this restaurant, and 
And I was getting a little nervous because it was like, oh, man, why don't we go walk Sunset, you know, see Hollywood? It's like, does he even really have an apartment? <laughs> uh, so then we started going, driving for, look for his apartment. He's like, oh, uh, where is this? Where is that? Oh, I think it's this turn. Oh, no, I missed it. And I started to wonder what was there even an apartment. So we ended up pulling up uh, Crescent Heights up into this gate where um, he was trying to punch in this code. And he said he wrote down the code because he could never remember it. And I was like fumbling through papers for him, and I pulled out a piece of paper that said one, two, three, four. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually we got into the parking garage, and um, it was a really nice place. It was stunning. Like there was, a, there was, it was on the third floor. There were palm trees. There was a little pool. Back to the Sunset Boulevard reference, um, and it was great. And we walked up to apartment three hundred four. And he's going through his keys, opens the door, and the apartment is just empty. There's no furniture, there's just a Jim Morrison poster hanging on the wall. There's one bed, and there's a TV with two pillars, exactly the way you see them in the room. That was actually used in the room, I was in that apartment that night. Uh, so there's one bed, and this is great, it's centrally located, I'll take it. He said, don't rush, don't rush, take your time. You don't have to decide now. I will take shower. Uh, you can have bed if you like. I was like, no, don't worry about Tommy. I'll sleep on the floor. So I ended up sitting on the floor. He was in the shower for a while, singing a whole new world from the lab. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I started to kind of fall asleep. And I heard the bed spring and stepped his weight. The door kind of closed. And then I heard somebody's chicken. <laughs> I didn't know what it meant, but uh, <laughs> I was half asleep anyway. Let's just pretend it never. Let's just pretend it was Tommy being Tommy for whatever reason. So I ended up staying in the apartment, um, and it was really bizarre. But within a few days, things started happening. All the things that I thought were impossible, getting an agent, um, getting connected in LA, all started happening, happening within a few days. I got hooked up with this. Asian called Iris Burton, who had discovered like Curse of Dunst and River Phoenix. And it was so random. It was almost like Tommy was like this magician who was making these things happen. Um, here I was focused on that part, um, thinking that was going to be something that was going to really be important. And then it was like meeting Tommy, not only did it give me more confidence and support, but things started happening. And so um, on my fourth audition, I booked the lead in a movie called Retro Puppet Master. Um, <laughs> It uh, wasn't the best, but uh, I ended up, my French accent ended up getting me the part, which sounds like a German accent in the movie, I don't know how that worked out. Directed by a Portland native, actually, um, named David Dakota. Um, That's and my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, your, your dad be directing hell. <laughs> So I booked the lead in this movie, and, and I later found out that James Franco had auditioned for the same part. So he really owes me for getting, for getting this movie. Um, so I, um, anyway, I thought it was going to be great. I ended up flying to San Francisco to surprise Tommy that I booked the lead in the movie. And when I got there, when I told him, he had a really strange reaction. He, he like started yelling, oh my god, I need candy. <laughs> reached into the back seat and started eating his chocolate. And like, I think he was excited for me, I wasn't sure. But, um, so I flew to Romania to shoot this, to shoot this movie. Um, and two weeks later, I was on a high. I thought it was going to be the start of something really, really great. Because that's what happens when you're a young actor. You think any role you do is going to be big. And you're, you quickly find out it's not. But um, I went back to LA on a high. And I get back to the apartment. And I find out that I have a Serious roommate. So um, I opened the door and uh, Tommy had moved in while I was gone and he bought, he took cur black velvet curtains and separated the apartment with those curtains. <laughs> so as I walk in, it looks like apartment chiller theater starring Tommy. <laughs> and uh, he peers his head behind the curtains and he goes, Hello there, stranger. <laughs> Nobody's allowed in here unless you have special access. <laughs> oh, 
He said, look, you, you got part, you can become actor, I can become actor too, I challenge myself. So tell me, what should I do? I was like, um, I don't know, you gotta get a SAG card. And so he becomes like really into it. He produces this Levi's commercial, which you guys saw in the documentary, <laughs> which is just absolutely incredible. He gets a SAG card, and he's just kind of trying to do a similar routine where he's getting these headshots made and sending them out to casting directors. Um, but I was trying to tell him, Tom, you have a very charming side to you, and these pictures are just obliterating it. Um, he looked like, you know, he said, well, I, I want to be a serious actor, you know? I, I, can, I can be Tom Cruise. Who is Tom Cruise? <laughs> so, if you're sending these headshots out to all these casting directors, the only ones that are going to call you in are ones that are going to wonder, wonder what it's like to be murdered. <laughs> he just didn't get it. And so he got more and more frustrated through these months uh, of not getting called in, not getting parts, and he really felt he had something to offer but wasn't getting the chance. And so um, I took him to see a movie called The Talented Mr. Ripley um, <laughs> on the night of the Golden Globes. He was having a fit. And so we went to go see this movie. Uh, there was a friend of mine living in San Francisco that was trying to warn me about Tommy that if I continued to be his friend and worse, live with him, I was going to end up like Dickie Greenleaf dead in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> so when I took him to see the town of Mr. Ripley, I was kind of wondering what he was going to think, because I'd seen movies with him before. Um, Fight Club, he thought the pace was too slow. <laughs> <laughs> he thought Her, which was came later, Her was the worst movie ever. What? <laughs> I know. I know. Um, so we saw the town of Mr. Ripley, he was riveted by it, and he didn't say a word, and at the end, he didn't talk for a while. And until we were driving home, he decided that he was fed up with Hollywood and he was now going to make his own movie that if, if Hollywood thought John and Mr. Ripley was a drama, wait until they see his movie, then they won't be able to sleep for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he sat down in the chair and he started telling me, look, this is what would happen. He would, this play would all take place in one room, one stage. I would play Johnny, all America guy. <laughs> he has a blondie girl, Lisa, she's trouble. You, you would play Mark, all America friend, and we call you Mark like this guy, Mark Damon. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, yeah, sure. Um, and so we started typing that night. We started writing the room, and he would yell stuff out like, I can't think in this house. Tell me not to eat this chocolate muffin. I get fat. <laughs> Greg, how many pages is movie script? <laughs> so he wrote for a while, and then he just straight up one night disappeared. He said he was going to London, but I know he wasn't in London. He disappeared for nine months. I was starting working this retail job, and I got these really cryptic messages from him. Um, I didn't know what he was doing. He sounded very, very depressed. And then it was like nine months later, he showed up. And we went, went to this restaurant that we used to always go to called Cantor's, which is featured in the disaster artist. They actually sit at the same table we sat at when he showed up huh. the script of the room. Nice. And um, I, I sat there. I wanted to read it, so I thought maybe there would be some clues in there as what he would have gone on. He didn't let me take it. He wanted me to read it opposite him. And so I read the whole thing in front of me, in front of him as he was watching me. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and I finished it and I thought, this is the most incredible, one of the most incredible things I've ever read. It is straight from his brain, on the page, no filter. <laughs> Every character talks like him. <laughs> so I would, uh, I would love to read some scenes with you guys. If you're, if you're of course. <laughs> what do you bother asking? Do you. you love somebody, do you? <laughs> <laughs> what is love? You think you hate everything, but you don't have everything. You have to have hope and spirit. Be an optimist. But can you handle all your human behaviors or others' behaviors? There's no question mark here. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be good, but great! 
<laughs> the Room, Act 1. Oh my god, this is a lot, right? <laughs> you, you want to skip this? I, I will read it. You can see the Golden Gate Bridge, sunrise behind the bay, then an external shot of an apartment building south of Market Street. There is a shot of a window of the room. It is furnished simply. As we pan across the room, we see a man and a woman asleep and partially naked. The alarm clock rings. The man reaches to the clock and turns it off. He sleepily arouses and puts on his shorts and walks slowly to the bathroom. He closes the door. Pan back to the woman waking up. The man comes out of the bathroom and smiles tenderly at her. I'm not a slave here, am I? <laughs> Did you like last night? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I did. Pause. What time do you have to be there? He pulls a suit from the closet and throws it on the bed and starts dressing. <laughs> Where is my coffee? <laughs> she gets out of the bed and puts on a revealing gown and goes to the kitchen. What time do you have to be there? He is yelling. I told you many times. <laughs> 930. I have my promotion to think about. <laughs> promotion, promotion. That's all I hear about. Here's your coffee and English muffin and burn your mouth. <laughs> he sits down at the table, drinking and eating. Oh man, donkey, let me know today. I have to think about our future. <laughs> Well, at least I don't have a promotion to think about. The computer business is too competitive. <laughs> <laughs> you have too much competition in the computer field. <laughs> I can handle it. You worry about yourself. You sound like we have separate lives. We will get married next month, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well... He stands up. Thank you for breakfast. He kisses her on the cheek and leaves. See you later. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Peter comes out of the door to the roof and finds Mark sitting on the bench, looking depressed. Oh, hi, Mark. What's happening? I hear. Pause. <laughs> this is a real place to date, huh? Mark pulls a joint out of his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> you want to put me on the clock? What's that? He points at the joint. He offers the joint to Peter. You want some? He holds up his hands. I got this sick feeling in my stomach. I did something awful. I can't forgive myself. Why didn't you tell me about it? I feel like running or killing myself or something crazy. <laughs> Anyway, it's none of your business. Why are you so nosy? You think you know everything. No no shit. Who do you think you are? You're acting like a kid. Grow up. Hey, who are you calling a kid? Fuck <laughs> <laughs> you. jerks his arm away from Peter's grip and hits him on the face with his fist and knocks him down.
Peter is unconscious. Mark stares at him. Johnny's your best friend. Peter takes off his shirt and wipes his face with it. Mark sits next to Peter. Are you sure you're okay? Pause. Why do you want to know my secret? Well, you're right. It's Lisa. I don't know what to do. I'm so depressed. I think I'll kill myself. Johnny's my best friend. She is so manipulative. <laughs> How did this happen? If Johnny finds out that will be the end of your friendship, what were you thinking? Look, life is very complex, but you have to face it. You have to be responsible. My advice to you is that you should stop thinking about her and never do sex with her. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, Peter. Let's go. <laughs> Come on now, Johnny. She's gone. In a few minutes, bitch. Three <laughs> months, bitch. You and your stupid mom. <laughs> Lisa goes over to the phone and punches numbers. <laughs> then walks holding it to her ear as far into the kitchen as the cord will stretch. Hi Mark, I need to talk to you. Don't pay any attention to Johnny. He's being a big baby. You know I love you very much. You are the sparkle of my life. I can't <laughs> live without you. I love you. Why don't you ditch this creep? I don't like him anymore. <laughs> I know. He's not worth it. Why don't I come up there and be with you? Sure, baby. Come on up. I want your body. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. I'm on my way. Bye. God. Lisa hangs up. Angrily, Johnny comes out of the bathroom. Who are you talking to? <laughs> Lisa takes a canvas bag out of the closet. Nobody. Johnny walks to the answering machine and pushes some buttons. <laughs> You'll just see all that. <laughs> Hi, Mark. I need to talk to you. Don't pay any attention to Johnny. He's being a big baby. You know I love you very much. You're the sparkle of my life. I can't live without you. I love you. Johnny presses the pause button. You little tramp! How could you do this to me? I can't go seven years of my life! Let's see what else we have on this day. No, no, stop! You little prick! I've been with you for seven years. You think you're an angel, but you're just like everybody. I treat you like a princess, and you stab me in the back! I love you, and I did everything to please you, and now you betray me! How could you love him? Let's see <laughs> Johnny presses the button. <laughs> Why do you diss this creep? I don't like him anymore. I know, it's just not worth it. What? Why don't you come up here, baby? I want your body. <laughs> you got it. I'm on my way. <laughs> Johnny picks up the machine and yanks it to break the wire and throws it against the wall. Everybody betray me! I'm not a friend in the world! I'm leaving you, Johnny. Lisa goes to the bathroom with her bag, throws a few things into it, and runs out the door with it. Johnny is yelling while Lisa is slamming the door. 
Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out of my life! <laughs> <laughs> Johnny picks up the TV and throws it through the window. <laughs> There's a big noise and crash outside the window. He yells, Screw the whole world! I don't need them! <laughs> More glass shatters. Johnny tips the chair over, then the sofa, and grabs the lamp and throws it out of the broken window. We hear a distant crash. He clears up the shelves with his hands, books and other <laughs> items fall on the floor, and throws out everything he sees and finds a wooden box about the size of a shoebox. He tries to pull it open, but he can't. He throws it to the floor, but it doesn't open. He kicks it, but it doesn't open. He pulls a piece of metal from the bottom of the chair <laughs> and pries open the padlock and succeeds. <laughs> he opens the box and takes out a gun. He is crying. <laughs> why? 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 Why is this happening to me? Why? Why is this happening to me? I can't deal with this anymore. It's over! It's over! <laughs> Suddenly, he stares into the closet. He reaches in and pulls out a sexy nightgown. <laughs> he holds it at arm's length. You tramp! You tramp! <laughs> he throws it down on the floor. He reaches in and pulls out more of Lisa's clothes and throws them on the floor. He lies on the clothes, unzipping his zipper. Oh, oh no! <laughs> He is breathing hard and writhing with pelvic thrusts. <laughs> when he finishes, he sits up and picks up the gun. His finger is on the trigger. Tears are flowing down his cheeks. He throws the gun away from him. He is crying with his face in his hands. After a while, he crawls to the gun, still crying out loud. <laughs> he reaches for the gun, with his, mid, with his hand shaking, he picks it up and points it at the middle of his forehead. Don't forgive me. Johnny pulls the trigger. He collapses onto the floor, groaning. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa opens the door to the apartment. Mark rushes in past her and kneels down beside Johnny's body. Also, several neighbors come in. <laughs> Lisa stands by the door with an expression of horror and her arms folded. 